Thank you. I hope you can all hear me all right. Um, I am only one half of a duo. This was made in collaboration with my colleague and friend, Nathan Gubbins, who's a PhD student at the University of Leicester. Uh, he sadly can't be here today because of transport issues. Um, his part of the presentation will be delivered today by me. I'm going to read his, his script from my phone, yeah? So I, I don't have two personalities. I'm just going to uh, do, do both parts of the presentation. So the origins of this paper has to do with a session that Nathan and I ran at the previous tank, where we wanted to see what, if anything, archaeology can do about contemporary climate change. So we're not interested in the study of climate change in the past, but actually uh, you know, contemporaneous catastrophic global warming. Um, and we were willing to accept that the answer may be very little or nothing, but we had the feeling that archaeology must have at least some part to play, since this issue is global and catastrophic and frankly affects all of us. So the, uh, yeah, good. This presentation is divided into three parts. First, I'm going to briefly introduce climate inequality. Uh, second, we're going to talk about archaeology as hyper-objects, using that as a new or newish theoretical framework. And then finally, I'm going to introduce a couple of case studies. The idea here being um, that we're going to suggest some possible features uh, that archaeology can, can use to, to be applied to solving climate change or addressing climate change. So I'm not... Um, reporting on research, it's rather we're throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. So I'm not going to waste any time explaining to this audience uh, about the negative effects of global warming, greenhouse gases, um, you know all very well. Um, however, I will briefly talk about uh, global inequality that's caused or exacerbated by global warming. Um, will this? No, you can't really see, but I'll just have to point. Um, <clears throat> in effect, the idea is this, that the countries who contribute the most greenhouse gases are often the countries who suffer the least. So, for example, um, countries that are in the, the green and the red from uh, North America and Asia, uh, like USA or China, or in the orange, uh, EU countries um, or Russia, uh, contribute a lot to global warming um, and have contributed a majority of the greenhouse gases uh, to, the, to the catastrophe. However, countries that have contributed the least are some of the ones in the, in the blue and green and, and purple boxes on the bottom right. Um, and some of these countries are especially devastated. There are countries in Oceania and in South Asia, uh, Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Maldives, which are at risk of becoming completely uninhabitable because mm -hmm. of sea level rising. Um, there are countries in Central Asia and West Africa, which we'll touch on a bit later, um, where it's at the risk of becoming, again, uninhabitable because of desertification. Despite the fact that these countries have contributed often less than 1% to global greenhouse gas emissions, they are the ones who suffer by far uh, the greatest. And this is a, a general um, uh, tradition of, of places being, you know, uh, those people who cause the problem are often the ones who suffer the least from it. And we're not naive, we're aware that global warming is an extremely difficult problem to solve. In many ways, it's not surprising that humans haven't solved it yet. Uh, in my opinion, it's perhaps the most difficult problem that humans have ever tried to solve. Uh, it's not obvious to the senses. Global warming is far away in space and time, affecting people that we in this room and online will never meet. It requires solutions that affect different people in different ways. And the consequences of any choices that we make to try to solve it will not be immediate, visible, or local. And global warming is so viscous, it's so sticky, that it adheres to everything that touches it. And it seems that our traditional ways of thinking are not good at solving this problem. So that would lead on to, uh, to Nathan's part of the presentation, um, where we introduce uh, hyperobjects. So the problem with climate change has been addressed um, within the last decade by this great book by Tim Morton uh, called Hyperobjects. Climate change has often been described as a constant that considers multiple things that are happening that contribute to the result of climate change. Often this leaves us with disjointed approaches to tackling climate crisis. Different political traditions prioritize different factors over others. Instead of hyperobjects, instead, in hyperobjects are a single material beast woven into an interconnected web of interacting entities. There are several key themes from Tim Morton's book that we think are useful when using archaeology to address climate change. And these are the four on the screen. First, that they are viscous. They pervade, linger, and penetrate, as well as being resilient. Almost everything that happens in the world contributes to global warming. Yeah, uh, from how we eat to how we travel. Secondly, climate change is non-local. 
Global warming means severe weather events are more and more common. Wildfires in California and Australia, floods in Pakistan, desertification in Central Asia and West Africa. Um, and although we can't link any one of those events to global warming, we know that, that global warming is making all these events more severe. No manifestation of the hyperobject is isolated. So although these appear to be different phenomena, they're ultimately one part of a greater phenomenon. Third is phasing. Global warming phases in and out and is brought in and out of focus at different times. So for example, the record high temperatures in the UK this summer um, brought climate crisis again to the front of the public agenda. And fourth is introjectivity. All these hyperobjects have entities that make up this single beast, all acting together in non-local threads that manifest their own space and time. They are viscous and come into focus at moments of great disturbance. Global warming is happening all the time, but we tend only to address them at moments of great catastrophe. So it's when it's brought into focus that we begin to try to address the problem. And archaeologists are already skilled at attending to objects, so why not hyperobjects? But the methods we have tended to adopt and develop in archaeology have it about creating specific histories and stories about particular things. Bayesian modeling and microanalysis, local histories, produce very specific stories about specific aspects of the past. Hyperobjects ask to consider how refined aspects of archaeology can inform us about global phenomena, massive temporal scales, and impossibly entangled networks. But how can we use these methods to study something that we cannot fully appreciate, such as climate change? And we're the opinion that archaeology, in many ways, is already well equipped at doing this, attending to things like hyperobjects, um, although we don't often use that name or that framework. Approaches such as symmetrical archaeology, for example, and assemblage theory have already provided frameworks that, one, break down the nature-culture dichotomy, and two, uh, enmesh humans into assemblages or networks along with other entities, or non-human entities, for example. Hyperobjects further ask us to utilize theories that consider the temporality that emerges between interrelated entities. Assemblage theory, for instance, considers time to emerge from the relationship between entities. For example, from the relationship between fast-moving ocean tides on the one hand and the slow and resilient properties of rocks on the other emerges cliff face erosion, which has a different temporality to its own components. In other words, the whole has components different from its individual parts. Archaeologists of all theoretical backgrounds are already good at telling narratives from multiple strands of patchy and broken data. I'm sure we can all agree with that. And I think there is space for the methods that archaeologists are already using to address some of the problems presented by hyperobjects, um, and therefore to climate change. So in brief, archaeologists are already doing things and have tools available to them that could be very applicable to addressing climate change and climate inequality. Okay, so <clears throat> now for the final part of this presentation, we're going to look at a couple case studies, both in contemporary West Africa. So the first is electronic waste, um, which as you can see in this picture, heaps up in enormous landscapes uh, in coastal West Africa on, on the Gulf of Guinea, the, the Atlantic coast. Um, so, as you can see, perhaps again from this picture, according to this uh, study from the Basel Convention, which I recognize is now over a decade old, uh, there's up to a million tons of domestic e-waste that's being imported to just those five countries on the Gulf of Guinea. And that number has perhaps increased uh, since that time. Most of that waste is imported from OECD countries like uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, etc. As near end of life equipment. So, what happens is uh, electronic devices, laptops and smartphones, et cetera, when they're um, at the end of life, so not quite yet broken, um, will be shipped to these countries so they can be used as cheaper electronic alternatives um, for, for developing urban nations in the global south. Yeah. Um, electronics have a high carbon footprint. They account for almost 4% of total global emissions. And I'm sure many of you have heard statistics of the carbon footprint of producing a, a smartphone, for example. Um, and so understanding their, um, their part in, in global warming as material, materials, as, as artifacts, as you will, um, is, is interesting. And, and some of the archaeologists perhaps have uh, the skills um, and interest to study. So we can think of e-waste dumps as archaeological landscapes. Um, and we can study these in the same way that we study material in the past. Yeah? So we have artifacts here, effectively, and assemblages. Uh, what's quite interesting to me is that both archaeologists and climate scientists are interested in the full picture of an object, yeah? Its production, its distribution, its consumption, and its deposition. 
And the pattern here with the, the e-waste and, and the Gulf of Guinea is that where these artifacts or electronics are being produced and consumed is different from the place they're being distributed. So again, this kind of picture of inequality appears. What's quite cool about this is that we can look at these artifacts, um, or again, we can look at these electronics as artifacts, try to understand them um, and the different ways they're mean, yeah, the meanings or uses they have. I'm particularly um, inspired by uh, this photo that uh, is on your right, which shows printers and computer monitors repurposed as stepping stones so to cross this lagoon in Ghana, uh, which is interesting, um, perhaps not, not only because of pollution, um, but interesting to archaeologists who are accustomed to thinking of how items might be repurposed. Um, there's also a, a, an element here of global archaeology, where we're finding artifacts that have um, elements that constitute it coming from all different parts of the globe, being distributed and consumed in very specific parts of the world, and then deposited in another different top pipe of the world. It's a really interesting way into global archaeology, which I know is a big theme at the moment as well. Um, and it kind of turns uh, traditional archaeological interpretations on the head, I think, um, because the ways that any given beach or lagoon on the Gulf of Guinea tells us very little about that location, but it tells us a lot about a global phenomenon. Yeah? And you might imagine a future archaeologist may encounter um, these enormous landscapes and think, you know, wow, the Gulf of Guinea was the place for electronics in the early 21st century. But it's not strictly true. It's just the place where these electronics are being deposited. And so now these are built into a global framework, which is quite interesting um, as an archaeologist, I believe. So our second case study takes us to Burkina Faso, where we'll be looking at desertification. So uh, there's Burkina Faso in the black circle there. It's a landlocked country uh, in West Africa. Uh, global warming, uh, again, caused by greenhouse gas emissions, mostly by very wealthy countries, um, has resulted in shifts in precipitation, which make rainfall both less common and more irregular. Um, so effectively, the wet season is getting shorter and shorter and later and later in the year, uh, causing droughts. Um, at the same time, global warming is rising the temperature in a region that is already very hot. Um, therefore, we have, or Burkina Fasans suffer a great deal of drought, um, which leads to degrading soils and then to crop failures. These crop failures then lead to displacement. And indeed, there are many people in Burkina Faso um, who are either emigrating to this very southern tip of the country or emigrating out of the country entirely. Uh, this desertification is a part of global warming, not just an effect of it. Uh, I was interested here um, in what Petersdorfer calls the dark side of things. And she said, archaeological artifacts attest to the dark side of things, revealing how their lives endure and outlive us and how they interact outside our control and domain. Um, and when I think about it, a lot of the material that archaeologists deal with, um, you know, typically in the field, are not necessarily the things that were most precious to the people of the past, although there are exceptions. It's typically the things that are hardest to get rid of. It's trash, it's pollution. And that could be the case with, you know, pottery shards. It could also be the, the case of, of pollution. Um, it's, in a way, the case of electronic waste. Yeah, what do we do with all of our rubbish? Um, and Pedro's daughter recognizes that this is a, a large majority of, um, of our archaeological assemblages. Um, and in a sense, the problems that we face today in pollution and, and global warming are, a, um, are also you know, dark sides of things. Um, I think greenhouse gases fit this definition quite well also. Um, they're objects that endure and outlive us, and they interact outside our control and domain. Yeah? We produce them, we put them in the atmosphere, but we're not keeping track of, and indeed, we're not really capable of, of dealing with them after they have, they have lives of their own after we've produced them. They, they have lives beyond us. Um, and there's a, as kind of um, mentioned in the previous presentation, there's a history to these artifacts too. In, in a sense, greenhouse gases could even be treated as an artifact. They are material things. Um, and greenhouse gases that were emitted by a British steam engine in 1752 are part of that same hyperobject as is desertification in Burkina Faso in 2022. And the origins of inequality in Burkina Faso may include those historical greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah? That's why um, so many global activists talk about historical emissions. And there's an archaeological perspective to this, that those historical emissions are artifacts in a wider hyperobject of global warming. Tangled with other phenomena, <laughs> the, the, the four bad seas, colonialism, capitalism, and climate crisis. Um, I also want to touch briefly on this uh, 
immigration aspect. Um, typically, at least in, so I'm really my day job is I'm, I'm an Anglo-Saxon uh, archaeologist. And when Anglo-Saxon archaeologists talk about immigration, we're often interested in the, the objects that immigrants bring with them. There's often a picture of, uh, we find in land B, uh, pots that come from land A, and therefore we assume that people migrated from land A to land B. Um, but what's quite cool about some of the photos that have been coming out from Burkina Faso is actually what people are leaving behind um, and what's being destroyed and changed by the desert. The lack of things demonstrates the hyperobject phasing in and out of focus. Yeah? So these things are disappearing, um, but at the same time, desertification is increasing. So where do the material fit into that is a question that archaeologists might be able to, to examine. Um, and archaeology, therefore, by also by looking at greenhouse gases, has the possibility to bring these back into focus. Yeah? It reminds us that we're looking, in a sense, at a large archaeological assemblage. So to conclude, climate change is a, a non-human beast that manifests in different ways at different places for different people. That is, it's a hyper object. And so what Nathan I would like to do is call upon us as archaeologists, uh, perhaps to trace the material emergence of climate inequality. Uh, I, in fact, I would argue that um, the previous presentation might be a good example of, of that also, yeah? Um, we think that archaeologists are uniquely positioned to tell complex stories of, of change in the past. Um, and again, as, as mentioned in the previous slide, when um, I think there's an advantage to recognizing that humans aren't necessarily um, the only characters in, in the great play of history, um, that actually we, we are one amongst a cast of other non-human entities, including non-living entities like greenhouse gases, all with their own affects, all with their own um, parts to play. Um, and archaeologists know how to tell, I mean, that sounds complex, but archaeologists are reasonably good at telling complex stories. And I think this maybe is a very important role that archaeologists have. Um, archaeologists already have a custom of giving voice to victims. I mean, I've definitely met many archaeologists who consider that to be their role. Um, and providing comprehensive information, patching disparate evidence together into a cohesive narrative, um, and also shaping a way of thinking about problems. And as we mentioned, global warming is an extremely ticky problem, and we need new ways of thinking about this. Archaeology, from my perspective, often has the ear of the public. Um, Archaeology ends up on the cover of glossy magazines, popular magazines, and in blockbuster exhibits in the na you know, national capitals and national museums that are visited by you know, hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, so, in fact, we, we may, I feel, should at least explore the possibility very strongly that we have a very strong public duty as archaeologists to tackling climate crisis. It's in some ways surprising because climate change is a, a modern day problem. It's a 2022, 2023 problem, 2024 problem, not a past problem. But in fact, uh, archaeology has at least some small part to play, maybe not a hero role, but important role to play in, in addressing global warming. Uh, I, I leave the thoughts up to you about what that may be. Um, but that's sort of our call to action. So uh, I thank you for your time and huge thank you to the organizers also. Thank you.